Kelly Appelstein, MSW, who is a nationally prominent youth care specialist and author, whose primary focus is on teaching positive strength-based theories and techniques to parents and educators who guide children, youth, and families. He is the president of Appelstein Training Resources and trains and consults throughout the United States as well as internationally and with treatment facilities, foster care associations, parent groups, schools, and juvenile justice programs. Charlie has authored three youth care books that are widely used within the field, including the book that you see featured out in the foyer, No Such Thing as a Bad Kid, Understanding and Responding to Kids with Emotional and Behavioral Challenges Using a Positive, Strength-Based Approach. He lives in southern New Hampshire with his wife and teenage daughter. Charlie's strength-based approach delivers a message of hope and possibility to our most vulnerable youth and to those who shape and influence their lives. You are in for a big treat. Please join me in a very warm welcome for Charlie Appelstein, who's going to stay down here with you guys. How's everybody doing? Great to be here. I gotta tell you right away, I'm actually very guilty about this book, No Such Thing as a Bad Kid, Understanding and Responding to Kids with Emotional Behavior Challenges Using a Positive Strength-Based Approach. Very guilty about this one because I wrote it before I became a parent. <laughs> My next book is There's Only One Bad Kid, <laughs> mine, but the good news is she's 20, she's not really a teenager anymore, she's, uh, she reads very well, so when she comes home from college, we still review chapter 12 on limit setting, it's not really work, and she's writing her own book, tells me a few years ago, Dad, you don't know how to talk to normal kids, maybe the trouble ones, I says, Julie, we'll be having a lot of talks over the next few years. I had a big one last winter when I accidentally erased Grey's Anatomy from the Comcast page. I didn't know she was watching it remotely from Washington, D.C. Oh, did we have a big one. But we learned that you can actually restore a deleted show. I did not know that. So we learned from our mistakes. So uh, it is a great pleasure to be here. But I have to tell you, to this day, I still find it funny that I'm training parents. I worked for 16 years in residential centers. I used to be the program director of a big center for adolescents and younger kids. Kids who have suffered terrible trauma, have serious behavior problems. That was my thing for 16 years. And then 25 years ago, I quit cold turkey to do this kind of work, training consulting. And when I started this job, I thought I'd only be training people who were working with severely disturbed kids in residential centers, psychiatric hospitals, juvenile justice. That was my thing. But right away, I started getting calls to do parent trainings at night teacher training, so I'm thinking, how could I take those jobs? I wasn't even a parent at the time, and parents have higher functioning kids. What do I know about that? Teachers have higher functioning, what do I know about that? But you know, I needed the money. So I took the jobs, they went really well. Now 25 years later, I do tons of parent trainings, tons of teacher trainings. And early on, it was so curious to me, because I could do a day-long training at a residential center, give the staff a lot of principles and tools that they loved, and, I, you know, and then at night, I do a parent training in a nice suburb, and I pretty much give the parents the same tools and principles. And they both loved it, and I get invited back, I get great feedback, I go, how's that work? How can I be giving the parents the same tools I'm giving the residential people? Then I figured it out. You know, tell me if I'm wrong. What I figured out is, the healthier a kid is, the more you can screw up with him or her. The more trouble they are, the more you're going to do it right. If you've raised your kids in a really good way, and they're wired nicely, and they have a good sense of self, you can go home tonight and punish them, yell at them, use sarcasm, be unpredictable, be mean, and they'll be fine. They say that workshop must have sucked. You know, dad's mom's in a bad mood. Conversely, if you took in a foster kid last week, and you go home and do the same thing to that kid, he goes ballistic and trashes your house. Same exact responses to incredibly different reactions. Why? The healthier you are, the more you will tolerate people not doing it right. The more trouble you are, the more you demand they do it right. So what I figured out, working in the 70s and 80s with severely traumatized kids, they forced us to treat them great. You yelled at them, you didn't have the right affect, you didn't approach them right, you didn't use the right words, you didn't have the right body messages, they would blow. And that, so we learned how to treat them great so they could be all that they could be. And then what I learned 25 years later is that the higher functioning kids, your kid, my daughter, they want the same thing. They want to be treated in that same great way. And just because they will tolerate less, why do it? Frankly, I believe if we treated every kid in the world as he or she was a seriously troubled kid, they'd all be healthier. Based on that dynamic, the healthier a kid is, the more he can screw up and vice versa. My wife and I have treated my 20-year-old daughter from the day she was born until now as if she's the most disturbed adolescent I've ever worked with. 
sometimes I think she's heading there, but there's nothing we've done with her. And she's turned out great that I wouldn't do with a kid at a residential center. From the day she's born, we have routines of predictability. Kids need a sense of regularity. They need to know what's happening next. Uh, if you don't have set routines in your house, you're going to have more activity, more behavior problems. Uh, books are coming out every day now that said if you have multiple kids in your house and you're having fights about the shower, about this, about scheduling and this and that, you should be having family meetings on a regular basis and having kids delegate who does this, who does that. For years, people say to me, doesn't it bug you dealing with acting out behavior? I said, I don't mind acting out behavior. I'm pretty used to it. I'll tell you what bugs me is acting out behavior I should have prevented. That bugs me. So if I'm working with a family or a treatment center anywhere and they don't have set routines, they don't have predictability, they're working harder. If you're having fights in the morning, fights at night around bedtime about who gets the kitchen, who gets the TV, who gets this, who gets that, that's on you. You should be having, the whole family should be having meetings to say, what is our routines here? Family dinners, more and more is reading about that. Teenagers, you know, they're separating, they're individuating, but they still need that sense of family. And so having, you know, they're all doing different things, try to find those times during the week where you have the family meeting without the cell phones and all that stuff. It's overwhelmingly out there now, the importance of the family meeting, the family dinner. So with my daughter, we always had routines. Homework was always around the same time. Dinner was always the same time. Bedtime. We tried to stick to everywhere I've ever worked. We try to come up with some sense of normalcy and regularity. So with my daughter, we always have routines. With my daughter, we have tried really hard not to yell at her. Whose need is being met when we yell at our kids? And it's really tempting when these kids are separating and individuating and giving you lip to yell back, to get mad, you know? It's always our need need to yell. You know, I have a technique, I call it the affect scale. This is probably one of the most important things when it comes to parenting or dealing with kids. It basically says the louder the kids get, the quieter you get. As they're getting louder, they're moving towards being out of what? Control. As they lose control, they need to see it. Can I please see you in the hallway? No, he's doing it too. I need to see that. I need to see that. They get louder, you get quieter. What's the only exception to this? When is it okay to yell? Danger. Which we're saying? If Brandy's crossing Main Street, there's a big truck coming. I don't recommend Brandy's truck. Could you please look up? Unless you hate Brandy. Appenstein said, don't yell. Now, you can get mad at your kid. Kids can really tick you off, particularly the teenagers. You know? But there's something I call a zone. The kid is really provocative to you, says something really mean to you, which teenagers do as they separate and individuate. Get angry at this. I'm really angry about the choices you're making right now. I'm not sure we're going to be taking that ride later. If you, I don't care. I hate you. We'll talk a little while. They left the zone. But angry at the choice, not the kid. Because if you say to the kid, I'm really mad at you, I'm disappointed in you, I'm upset, they take that on. And it makes them feel worse about themselves. You know, so try when you're angry at your kids, model it appropriately. Angry at the choice. I'm angry about the choice you should make it. I'm not sure. I don't care. We'll talk a little while. Angry at the choices, make it a teaching moment. You know? uh, so my daughter, we really try to control tone and affect, affect scale, all that stuff. With my daughter, we always try and say please and thank you to her when we make a serious request. That's my number one feedback in 42 years in the business. I can bump into a parent, a teacher, a residential worker, a foster parent. Number one thing I've been hearing for 42 years is, Charlie, you're right. Ever since we started saying please and thank you to the kids, every time we make a serious request to them, the whole mood of my house, my place has changed. Why is please and thank you my number one feedback? It's not the social etiquette. Sure, you should model that. It's because everything we say in this world, everything we do in this world, has a, a content and a message. How fast you approach your kid, the look at your face, the angle you approach your kid, you can make a break in interaction just with your body. Oftentimes when I have an angry kid, I lie down next to the kid. What's the message you send to a kid if you've got an angry kid sitting in a chair and you lie on the floor like this? What would be the message you would send to your kid? Any age, what? I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you, this is gonna pass, I'm not that upset. Conversely, how about you approach an angry kid like this? You just send a volume of message and now you wonder why he's fighting you. You can make or break an interaction with your kids just with your body language. You know, always going to approach two way, way, arms length away. You, you can send great messages. And your words send messages. You know, uh, what's your name? I can say, you know, Robin, you look great today. Or I can say, hey, you know, Robin, you look great today. I'm kidding, you look great today. 
Content was exactly the same. The message is different. First time Robin looks great today. Second time. You don't want to see Robin on non-workshop nights. I'm telling you right now. You look great today. Content was exactly the same. The message is different. Could you please see me in the hallway? Thanks. See me in the hallway. Start your homework. Could you please start your homework? Thanks. Night and day. When my daughter was going through all that tough stuff as a teenager, I'm so cognizant to do all the stuff I'm talking to you now. And whether it works or not is immaterial, by the way. You know, it's not always going to work. It doesn't mean she's always going to listen. But she knows dad is respectful to me. And, this, you know, the teenage stuff, it's going to pass. You know, at some point, they do settle down, you know. Uh, but you, they need to look back and say, no matter how tough my adolescence was, my parents were respectful. They didn't overdo it. They didn't misuse power, because if you're not you're doing what I'm saying, you're misusing power. Gordon, who wrote Parent Effectiveness Training, sold millions of copies in the 70s. He says, uh, you want to know why so many teenagers act out? It's payback for the power that was misused against them when they were younger. A lot of parents yell at kids. A lot of parents don't say the please and thank you. A lot of parents don't have the body language. This is the little stuff that brings down the big stuff. Just think how many times you make requests of kids. Think how many times you have tough interactions with them. If you're yelling, if you're not using this language, it builds up. It builds up. Uh, it's a little stuff that brings down the big stuff. You know? um, so with my daughter, we always try to say please and thank you. Try to be, watch our body language and so forth. Uh, try not to start any sentence with the word you. You start a sentence with the word you, it's going to come out hostile. You need to move your stuff over there. You need to knock that off. You need to look more interested in this training you. That's a W that's even worse. You want to start with I or we, him a little cunt we seem bored. You can protect it like the last hour and 15 minutes. Thanks, dear. Appreciate it. I or we. I challenge you. Watch, how it, watch your interactions at home. See how this is going. You want to get down rid of the big stuff? You take care of the little stuff, you know? Um, so my daughter, we did that. With my daughter, we've always used consequences instead of punishment. I don't think a kid should ever be punished. I think consequences make sense. What do you think the difference between a consequence and a punishment is? Huge difference. Any thoughts? Exactly. Uh, consequence is related to what the kid did, but punishment isn't. When you punish, you're basically inflicting pain as a deterrent. By the way, well, I knew what I was thinking of saying something. Oftentimes parents, you know, when I'm doing this training, they'll say to me, so Charlie, what do you think about spanking? You know, I say, well, that's a no-brainer. You know, if any of you went to work late tomorrow, and the boss called you and says, come here, hon, got to give you a little spank, you'd go ballistic. You know, you'd be in every, you know, you'd be viral on YouTube. Yeah, you got a little kid at home, whack, whack, whack. No one says a darn thing. You shouldn't do anything to a kid. You won't want to send a dunk to yourself, you know. Um, so consequences uh, are related to what the kid pun punishment is. Punishment is all about inflicting pain. I don't think a kid should be punished. Yet, yeah, what do parents do all the time when their kids acting out? Teenagers, they take this phone away. They take something away. What does that have to do with anything? You were driving home from this training today and the cop pulled you over the speeding. He said, excuse me, miss, what's your favorite TV show? What's your favorite TV show? <laughs> I can't even think of one. Uh, Law and Order, you're, you know, you're kind of sucking up to me right now. You, know? uh, you can't watch it for a year. What? Give me the freaking ticket. That's two years for your attitude, lady. You go ballistic if they took a show. You, you go home, the kid's acting up. Give me the Game Boy. Give me this. Give me th What does that do with him? That's power. You're, you're teaching the kid that when I want to control you, I'm going to misuse power. Now, don't feel guilty if you've been taking stuff away. What did I say earlier? If you're a loving parent, you can do almost anything to grow up fine. A lot of us in this room, we were spanked, we had things taken away, we were yelled at, and we grew up fine. Because mostly what we got was good, loving stuff. I would argue you might be a little bit happier. You might be even a little more effective as a parent if that stuff didn't happen and you weren't doing it yourself. See, if you love your kids, that's 90% of it. You, could do, you don't have to do anything I'm telling you today, and you still grow up okay. This isn't about good versus bad, my stuff. This is about good trying to be even better. It's all about one word, probability. The better we do, the better they're going to do. And I would bet my life that if you do the stuff I'm talking about, these kids are going to do even better, be even happier, and raise their kids in a better way. So consequences are related. So don't feel guilty, you know, if, if you're not doing the stuff I'm talking about, you know. Think about what you're hearing tonight, if you're not doing what I'm saying, as you're a good parent and you're trying to be even better, not good versus bad. So punishment takes away from your relationship. It's all about misusing power against a kid. Now, it's better than doing nothing. I'd rather you take something away or do that than do nothing, because it's still a limit thing set. But in my packet, you know, I have a nice handout you can get. I have five or six consequences that we've been using with kids of all different ages for 40 years. 
Kids act it out. Ask them to take a break. Chill out. You know, uh, I don't like the term time out. I said, I tell kids, if I'm in a meeting and I'm getting mad, principal might say, Charlie, take a walk, chill, that's all. I don't, I don't even, I don't have, I don't like time out chairs, timers, all that stuff. It's just a natural thing. You choose where you want to go. You know, when my daughter, when she was a teenager, I would often be the one to take the time out. I would, to this day, you ask my daughter, what was the worst thing your dad did in discipline? She said he'd walk away from me when I was really acting up. She hated that. I said, you know, I don't like the choices you're making. I'm going to the back room. We'll talk about this later. We're not doing anything until we work this through, but I'm walking away right now. Oh, she hated that. <laughs> but you can also ask a kid to take a break, chill out, use that kind of language. You know? uh, what other consequences do we do with teenagers and younger kids? Uh, uh, I like proximity manipulation. What that says quite simply is when kids are acting out, they've got to be watched more closely. If they're getting in trouble with a brother or a sister in a room and you're trying to cook in the kitchen and you warned them a few times, now they've got to be in the kitchen. If you ground your kid, for doing something serious. That's pretty much proximity manipulation. What you're saying to the kid is you're not grounded to be in pain. You can watch TV, you can do stuff. You're grounded because you lost your trust and you have to earn it back. So kids get caught doing drugs or they come in past curfew or do something kind of serious. They can be grounded, but they're not grounded to be in pain. It's not a punishment. They're grounded because they lost their trust and now they have to earn it back by talking to you about the issue, maybe getting some help about the issue. But it's not a punishment. They lose their freedom when they do something kind of serious. With my daughter, we also, and many kids I've worked with, we use reparation now and then. It's kind of like community service. So the message here is, if a kid is acting out, like being really fresh and argumentative, all that kind of stuff that classic teenagers do, you could kind of say, you know, the way you're choosing to act is taking away a lot of the good feelings we have in this house. I know this is adolescent, I know it's, but you're crossing the line. So you're not watching TV or doing anything until you give something back. So you need to do a chore, you need to do something nice for someone in the family. So it's kind of like community service. I remember when my daughter was in middle school, oh, she was really going through that tough adolescent thing, giving me all this crap and everything so rude to me and my wife, and it was classic adolescent stuff. But she was starting to overdo it. And one day I just had enough. And I went to the back room and I wrote two pages on the computer called the Julie's New Rules of Conduct. And I came back into the living room where she was and I gave her one copy, I had another copy, I turned the TV off and said, okay, I want you to hear your rules of conduct. If I come home any time in the next three weeks and I say, how you doing, Julie? And you say anything other than, good dad, how are you? You owe me a 20 minute job. Because you're taking away a lot of the good feelings here with how you're choosing to act like. So you gotta give something back. If you get on your little gizmo and you start complaining to the world about how bad I am, you lose the gizmo for an hour. If you do it again, you lose it for a day. If you get four or more of these jobs in a day, for choosing to act disrespectfully, um, we'll go to family therapy. Obviously, I'm not doing my job. Something's going on here if it's too much. Well, it really worked. Kind of settled down. She wanted the limits set. Remember, teenagers want limits set. They just need to be fair and stuff, even if they argue. But what was really cool was two days later, they had a big concert at the middle school. I walk, my wife wasn't around. I walk into the lobby. I get accosted by kids, parents, teachers. I'm going, what? They go, we love your rules of conduct. We love you. Was my, my daughter posted it online. You know? And like 50 people pat me on the back. We love your rules of conduct. See, my daughter didn't like being out of control. Didn't like crossing the line. She wanted to everybody to know that I was rain or rain. And so that's a really nice logical consequence. These are all related to what they did. And what do consequences do? Because it's really important to understand what consequences do. They reinforce values. They're not really about teaching. They reinforce. If you have a value in your house that says we talk to everyone with respect, then a kid, particularly a teenager, is really being disrespectful, that going against the value. So now the consequence basically says we take this seriously. And again, how you apply it is really based on who the kid is, and you always want to be cognizant of the developmental stage. Teenagers, what is a teenager? They're going through the second phase of separation individuation. First you get the terrible twos. What's the terrible twos all about? They're separating, they're individuating, the world's opening up. Cognition's improving, they can walk, they can talk. The world, it's so exciting. The world, but yet it's frustrating because they don't have that many skills. So they get frustrated and stuff. So who do they take out their anger at? They're frustrated, you. That's where the trouble twos come from. The frustration over this new world opening up. Well, the adolescence is the second phase of separation and situation. Now your teenagers are separated. They're thinking about being their own person, going into the world. They have momentous things to think about. 
What's my sexuality? What do I want to be? What's my peer group? Where am I heading? What do I want to do? What's my major? Oh, there's so much stuff coming down on an adolescent. And so there's a lot of pressure. And so who do they take it out on? You. Because you're the mother and father. You're the ones who's supposed to keep them safe. And so you have to understand that some of this stuff you get from the teenagers, it's necessary. They need to be able to discharge it onto somebody. And if you overreact to it, you're going to stifle their adolescence. So I always tell adoles parents of adolescents and younger kids, the real key to get through these years is balance. You set reasonable limits that are all related. You know, you, you keep your tone and act that good, but you stay very nurturing at the same time. You don't overdo. And, when, and then the kid comes together. That's what it's all about. So my daughter, we always use consequences at all age instead of punishment. Um, with my daughter, we used a lot of humor with her, still do, but not sarcastic. It's really tempting to be sarcastic with kids. One expert said, when you're sarcastic with kids, it makes them afraid of you. Another expert wrote, sarcasm is veiled hostility. I love sarcasm. I get in trouble all the time on the fantasy football boards. I zing another player and he won't even talk to me for a week. But with my daughter and kids I work with, any time I want to use a sarcastic statement, I quickly ask myself, is this really making the kid feel good? And 99 out of 100 times it's a day, it doesn't make them feel good. Now, I know a lot of us like sarcasm, you know, but think about it, please. Every time you want to use it with your kid, is it really making the kid feel good? Is it bringing the kid up or bringing the kid down? I say most times it's bringing the kid down. So is there anything I just mentioned that you wouldn't do with a troubled 17-year-old in the residential center? Exact same thing. The difference is I could have gone away with stuff with my daughter. I could have yelled at her, I could have punished her, I didn't have to say please and thank you, I didn't have to have routines as tight as we did, and she still would have grown up fine. But why do it? I want her to be the best she can be, and I think the stuff we're talking about now is really respectful, and builds these kids from the inside out, and it really says, I take you seriously. Respect is really important, so I am not going to boss you around. I am not going to misuse power. I'm going to listen to you, I'm going to connect with you. Uh, and then what I learned about 15 years ago is this approach or all these things I'm telling you actually has a name. It's called using a positive strength-based approach. And this whole strength-based approach, it's revolutionizing the way we take care of kids and our homes and our schools and our treatment centers. And the research backs it up, which I'll share with you. Uh, there will be no other way of teaching parenting, of teaching teachers like I do, how to deal with kids than this approach. Uh, and like I said, it's being backed up by some of the most cuttingest research in neuroscience. What is the approach? Here's a simple definition of strength-based practice. Strength-based practice, an emerging approach to raising kids that is exceptionally positive and inspiring. It's focused on strength building rather than flaw fixing, what your children do right versus what they do wrong. It begins with the belief that all young people have and can develop strengths and use past successes to curb problem behavior and enhance functioning. That's a simple definition, but to me, strength-based parenting, the strength-based approach, is really about two words attitude and actions. It starts with the attitude you convey to every kid from the second they're born and then forever that says, I believe in you. I think you're one amazing kid. You're going to make it with me. You're going to make it in life. And I'm absolutely thrilled to be part of your journey. Now let's get going. Then everything you do with your children from the second they're born and forever has to be an extension of the attitude that says, boy, do I love you. Boy, do I think you're one special kid. You're going to make it with me. You're going to make it in life. Let's go. And let's talk about that special word. More and more experts I'm reading are saying, don't call your kids special. Don't make them feel special. You're, you're creating monsters that way. They don't get it. See, what's been happening in parenting is that we have overdone it over the last 30, 40 years. Every kid gets a trophy. You know, if they, have a, if they, they, have a, they don't make the team, oh, that's a bad coach, you should have made it. You know, we coddle kids to build their self-esteem or we feel bad when they're upset. Let's not do that anymore. Kids need to learn that they're not always going to make the team. You know, you can try harder next year. When you go out for the tennis, put more time in, you'll probably make it. You've got a lot of talent. Don't blame the coach. You can work harder. Not everybody gets a trophy. You know, you want to get that trophy, put some more time in. You know, uh, if they're really struggling with something and they're upset, instead of you solving the problem, what have you done before when you've been in this situation? You know, but, you know, that doesn't mean, though, that you can't make them feel special. They're throwing the baby out with the bathwater. That doesn't mean kids don't do chores. You know, if you ask me, the two biggest mistakes I made as a parent, luckily they weren't disastrous. My kid should have done more chores. I, I, I coddled her too much. And she should have been volunteering somewhere. 
More and more evidence is coming out every day that support both of those things. Kids need to be part of the family. They need to see that they made to feel special, but that doesn't mean they're on some pedestal. They still do the dishes. They still clean up. They still do stuff. They're part of the family, and that's really important. And again, more and more reports are coming out that says it is so amazingly helpful, particularly for character development, to have your kids volunteer somewhere, to see the other side of life. Those are the two things if I could do over, I'd do over in a second. But you can make your kids feel special. They should think there's someone in the next room that thinks I could do anything in this world. But that doesn't mean you're coddling them. That doesn't mean that you're consoling them if they didn't make the team or you're still helping them develop what we call grit. That it's okay to screw up, it's okay to make mistakes. I'm not gonna coddle you, learn from it and get up and try harder next time. And then we develop kids who really are strong and can go into the we have so many kids going to college now, as soon as they have some a disappointment or a problem, they're calling home, they're crying, or they're dropping out, because we haven't prepared them for adversity. So, but let's not ever think that it's not right to make your kids feel special. They should all think there's someone in, you know. And uh, needless to say, what we're talking about here is building a great relationship with your kids. And almost all the research now on kids says the same thing. For a kid to succeed in life, they need to have powerful relationships with their family and others in the world. This guy, James uh, Gabarino, uh, is like an expert on kids. He said, I saw him speak in front of a thousand people in Las Vegas. He said, we can now predict with almost 100% certainty whether a teenager with a history of aggression will commit another act of aggression when he or she enters the high school in the fall. If we can look into this kid's life at any moment while they're at the school and see this one factor present, we don't worry about the kid. What do you think that is? You got a tough kid entering this high school, and it's this one adult, one adult who thinks I'm terrific. And I tell parents, every kid has to say that about you. Every kid has to go to bed at night thinking, I got one or two parents in that next room that think I'm terrific. Anything less than that, and that kid is not going to be all that they can be. You know, the relationship developed. And how do we build great relationships? All the stuff we're talking about today, how you talk to them, how you greet them, your affect, all this, how you deal with discipline, how you stick to routines, how you make them take responsibility for things. All of this stuff I'm talking today is about building great relationships. And that's really the fuel of a great family is the relationships that you create. Uh, why else is it so important to have this incredibly powerful attitude that says, I believe in you, I can't wait to see you, you're gonna make with me, you're gonna make in life, let's go. One reason is because it helps you build a great relationship. Another reason is that it attacks the self-doubt that all kids struggle with. Is it not true that at almost every age a kid is at, they struggle with self-doubt? Is that not Especially with the social media and stuff like that, they're comparing themselves to other kids. Well, Degas, the great artist, said self-doubt kills ability. Kind of impressed, I know about Degas, the great French Impressionist, born 1767, died 1833, created 1,500 Impressionist paintings. Is that impressive? Is it? Thank you, thank you. I don't know anything about Degas. I thought his name was Degas. I thought he was from Boston. <laughs> but I got the ADD thing, so I'm always clicking, watching six shows at once. So I get the back TV room to myself. So a few years back, I'm clicking, clicking, clicking. I stop on PBS, and they're doing these one-hour bio pictures, the great artists of all time. So I guess they stumbled out to Degas. He paints the brown tinged ballerina pictures you see in the museums. So in the scene I was watching for 18 seconds, he's talking to a little ballerina who's obviously struggling with her confidence, and he says, self-doubt kills ability. I said, I'm going to remember that line. Strength-based practice says, every one of your kids has amazing ability, but they won't come close to using it if they're riddled with self-doubt, if they're struggling with that. A strength-based parent knows every one of their kids can do amazing things in this world, but they're not going to get there if they're riddled with self-doubt, if they're struggling with self-doubt. So you do things that attack that self-doubt. What are some of those things? One, get excited about little changes. Say you've got a teenager right now who's driving you nuts, but tomorrow he drives you a little less nuts. My man, that was a good day today. You know, there were a couple times where you were starting to lose it and you took a step back, like with your brother around the dinner. I love that man, I love that man. I was telling your mother, I was so proud of you. I can still remember like yesterday when my daughter was like 13 or 14. She was driving me nuts with her attitude, the classic adolescence. But every now and then I'd see something good she said. I go, Julie, I gotta tell you, mom and I were talking about you. Today was great. When you said that, and then you said that, you know, and, and we get her good for like a couple of days, you know, you know. That's how you deal with kids instead of, you know, I'm glad you did a little bit better today, but you're still rude a lot of the time. You still give it, no, 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 no. You, you, you see a little change, you get really excited with that. 
In the strain phase, we'll be seeing little changes ripple into dramatic solutions. You know? I had a kid, a middle school kid I was working with. He was skipping school four days a week when they asked me to work with him. Very first day I met him, I said, if you skip three next week, I'll give you a big sandwich on Friday. He skipped three, I gave him a sandwich. Teachers want to kill me. How can you give the freaking kid a sandwich? He, he skipped three days. I got kids coming every day to get nothing because he didn't skip four, he skipped three. Within two months, he's coming every day, graduated with honors. You think that was a good investment? Because I know when kids are struggling, you got to get excited about little changes. If you have a kid who's acting out a lot, get really excited if they act out a little less tomorrow. And, and almost amplify it. Wow. Wow. That's like, you had the best day today you've had in weeks. I'm loving it. I'm loving it. I'm kind of curious why you had such a good day today. You know, I'm kind of thinking that the maturity thing is kicking in. You're thinking about some of this stuff, and you know that going with the flow and acting more mature is going to open up more doors, get you more freedom here. That's it, isn't it? I know, I know, I know. Now, it could be she was just sick, you know, and the only reason she did better was because she didn't have any energy. But now I'm complimenting and I'm giving her a reason that she buys. Now she walks away. That's true, I am getting older more mature. I actually have a name for this technique. It's called amplifying change using speculation. So you got a kid who does a little better amplify than speculate. And they often buy it. It's hysterical. See, we're smarter than our kids. If you come up with this stuff, you can change it, you know. Uh, what else do we do to attack self that our kids struggle with? Change their thinking. Think about it. Anytime you act out, anytime a kid acts out, there's always some bad thinking right before it. I'm stupid, I can't do this, I'll never make, right? They don't act out out of the blue. Something's going on in their head. Often it's faulty. Kids who suffer anxiety, often it's faulty thinking, irrational thinking. So we should be attacking the thinking. Instead of waiting for them to act out and doing something, how about get at the root cause? Their original thinking. You know, I'm working with a kid, I'm driving with a kid, and I'll go, what's a mistake? And the kid has to say, an opportunity to take. What's a mistake? You know, you know, I come home from work. Hey guys, I made a big mistake at work today. Was I excited or what? What's a mistake? Yeah! Kid comes home from school, middle school kid, you know. Did you make a mistake in school today? Did you make a few mistakes? I love that! I love that! What's a mistake? Yeah, but it's an opportunity to take, right brother? Yeah. Do we learn from our mistakes? Does everybody make mistakes? You know, we have so much kids with pressure that they feel if they screw up, they get disappoint you, they disappoint themselves, they don't get something. And it's all this pressure that they don't need. Kids need to learn that it's okay to screw up. It's okay to make mistakes. They're comparing themselves. And if, they, if you model for this, hey guys, you made a big mistake at work today. Oh, did I make a doozy? Was I excited or what? You know, I learned from that mistake. Now I'll never make it again. I'll be even better, you know? Uh, uh, and oftentimes your kids can't handle winning and losing because their self-esteem is fragile, especially if they're a fragile time of life. So I'm driving with a kid, I'll go, remember, if you lose, don't get the blues. If you lose, if you lose, and if you don't win, just grin. If you don't win, okay, you got the little cross game tomorrow. I know you're into it. I know you're passionate. You might win, you might lose. And if you lose, don't you get the blues. And if you don't win, yeah, yeah. You know, so you got a kid who's kind of a hothead. Practice this stuff. Practice. Show them how you do it. With constant repetition, you can change their thinking. They need to hear this stuff. This should be on refrigerators. I put this in schools all over the place. It changes the way they think. You should be figuring out where is your kid coming from and how do we change that thinking? How do we model? You should be telling kids you use this stuff. Then they might listen to you a little bit more. You know? Because what's bringing your kids down? It's not their talents. I think every kid has amazing potential. It's their thinking. If it's thinking, change the thinking. If it's thinking, say it can act so. What were you thinking right before you pushed your brother? What were you thinking? He's no good, you know, he's getting more attention. That's not right, that's stinking. Yeah! Let's go back into the time machine, man. Right before you push your brother, what could you have said? He's a little kid, let it go. That's what little kids do. Yes, 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 slap me back. Yes, yes. So when your kids do act out, use it as an opportunity to replace it. What could you have thought? This is the thinking that's bringing down. You know, I love, with kids too and myself, to teach them the wants and the needs. I tell kids, you know, when you get upset and stuff, you might want to hit somebody, you might want to do something, but then quickly say, oh, what do I need to do? I tell kids, if I, you have Dunkin' Donuts in Los Angeles? I mean, in this area? It's a donut shop, okay. 
It's a big donut chain around America. I tell kids, if I walk into Dunkin' Donuts, what do I want? Chocolate-covered coffee roll. What do I need? Veggie egg white. <laughs> you know? So, someone pushes you, does something, what do you want to do? You want to hit them. What do you need to do? Walk away. Let it go. Work it out. Use your words. What a wonderful gift you could give your kids. And tell them how you use this. Guy cut me off today. You know, you're at dinner. Guy cut me off today. I want to give him the finger and stuff. And I said, you know, who knows? Maybe he's on the way to the hospital. Maybe some. I said, what do I need to do? Let it go. Just let it go. They're going to start using that if they hear you use it. You know, I love wants and needs. I use it on myself all the time. Every now and then I want to email someone a really bad message or something because I don't like what they said. And then I think, okay, that's what I want to do. What do I need to do? Let it go. Just let it go. So all this stuff is about getting your kids thinking, tacking the self-doubt that they have. It's powerful stuff. Powerful stuff. And what are we talking about now? We're talking about really changing your kids' mindset. Letting them understand it's okay to screw up. It's okay to make mistakes. We all make mistakes. You know, normalize this stuff to these kids. It takes the pressure off. It takes the anxiety. And really, like I said, what you're doing is changing their mindset. You know, this lady, Carol Dweck, wrote a book called Mindset. <laughs> it's getting a lot of play. She says, for 20 years, my research has shown that the view you adopt yourself profoundly affects the way you lead your life. If you think you're not that good because you lose, if you think you make a lot of mistakes, if you have this kind of negative mindset because of the pressure you're putting on yourself, if you don't understand it's okay to screw up and stuff and enjoy life, that's going to affect you. Now, Dweck's big claim to fame is this thing called the fix versus the growth mindset. Did I put it up here? Yeah. She has warned parents for many years now to be really careful about calling a kid smart. She said, if you call your kids smart a lot, they develop a fixed mindset I'm a smart kid. Then when they go to school and they screw up, they melt down. They say, you know, I'm a smart kid, I should get this. So what she recommends parents, and really of all ages, is not focus on the F word, but tell kids it's okay to screw up. It's all about effort in life. If you make a mistake, you screw up, get up and try again. And she says, the kids who get that from their parents develop what we call a growth mindset. That they understand life is about struggle, about adversity. And if you approach that adversity with vigor, and you get up and try again, you'll do so much better. And her research is really clear that the kids who develop the growth mindset, they do so much better in life. They learn that it's okay to screw up, it's okay to make mistakes. They have a mindset that says, life is about struggle. It is about having, making mistakes. Get up and try again, as opposed to the kids who think, I'm a smart kid, I'm a great kid, his mom always tells me that. Yes? Yes, and I'm glad you said that because he's saying, isn't it okay now and then to say that because you want kids to know it goes against that I think you're pretty smart. Yes, because what I was going to get to is when, 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 when her stuff came out, she got a lot of criticism. A big psychologist named Alfie Kahn really took her over the coals. He says, you know, if you never call your kids smart, they'll think they're dummies. They should hear it now and then. And she agreed. But the key is, not all the time. You know, and also kind of define smart. Smart means you're smart enough to know that you're going to struggle. You're going to make mistakes. Figure it out and ask someone else. So there's nothing wrong with saying you're one smart kid, you can figure this out. But just don't overdo it. Because a kid can develop that fixed mindset. I'm a smart kid, and then they melt down when they make a mistake. They can hear the smart word as long as you're giving them that other stuff at the same time. It's okay to screw up. What's the big word you hear in parenting now? Grit. Kids don't have enough grit. They don't, can't handle adversity because they have these fixed mindsets and we haven't been pushing that it's okay to make mistakes. It's normal to make mistakes. It's okay to struggle, stuff like that, you know. I love the eagle metaphor. I get in front of kids all the time. I certainly did it with my daughter. And I said, if I'm an eagle on the ground and I do this, do I get very high? No, but what if I do this? I get really high. The harder I try, the higher I fly. The harder I try, the harder I try, be the eagle, be the eagle. Now, if you try really hard as an eagle, you're gonna get high in the sky. You'll be able to build a nest in any tree, swoop down any prey. You will be successful, but you'll probably hit a branch, clip a wing as you try hard. That's a mistake. And what's a mistake? An opportunity to take. What's a mistake? I had a mother of a kid, a teenage, young teenage kid, take a piano lessons. She didn't like taking the lessons. Mother put an eagle on the piano. Said, the harder I try, harder I fly. She's been practicing hard ever since. I love it. I got schools, I got refrigerators that have the eagle on it. You know, it really is such a beautiful message to kids. You know, just keep trying. If you screw up, get up, try again. You know, do the best you can. 
Uh, now, as I mentioned to you before, you can call kids smart, just define it. You know, you're smart enough, you're smart, but smart means you're smart enough to know that you don't know everything. It's okay to ask for help. You're smart enough to know that if you're not sure how to do something, it's smart to check out how others are doing it. You're smart enough to know that sometimes you need to learn how to learn first. You can't push effort at a kid if you really can't do what you're asking. Otherwise, you'll just get frustrated. But you're smart and absolutely capable of learning a great deal of becoming successful. That's beautiful stuff. I think things like this, there are a dime a dozen on the, on the internet. This should be hanging somewhere in a refrigerator now and then. You know, Michael Jordan said, I missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games. 26 times I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and missed. I failed over and over again in my life. That's why I succeed. That's beautiful stuff. For a kid who's struggling with anxiety and pressure, they need to hear that the greatest basketball player in the world, look what, look what he went through. That can take the pressure off your teenagers. Whether they admit it or not, they like reading that stuff. They need to hear that stuff. And there's a lot of that out there. Uh, a guy named Sprick writes pretty good books on classroom behavior management. He says, you want to know why kids act out in school? Two big reasons. One, they don't believe they can do the work, and two, they have no clue why it's relevant to their life. I would be rich beyond belief if every time I got referred an acting out kid, and I, I worked in schools with acting out kids, I had a nickel for every time we found out he had a hidden learning disability, Asperger's syndrome, was, had some kind of sensory integration thing, uh, like I said, learning disability. Uh, the biggest crock in the world I tell people is that kids like acting out. Some is normal for you know, the adolescent stuff, but kids who chronically act out, they don't like that. I've had teachers say he likes being sent to the office. He gets to avoid the work, secretary's nice to him. I said, no, they don't. They'd rather be the kid who's not being sent to the office. If a kid is chronically acting out in a school setting, you should make sure that they are really evaluated. Because a lot of the problems kids have are hidden. It could be a processing issue. It could be a sensory integration thing. It could be aspirin. It could be a lot of different things. I remember working at a school and there was a kid who was always acting out, driving the teachers and the principals crazy. For two, three years this went on. I don't know why they didn't ask me to work with the kid, but he was really pushing buttons. They hated this kid. After three years, they found out he could only hear every other word. Can you imagine how guilty the whole staff was? You know, Kids who are acting out, we've got to always investigate. What's going on here? Because they want to do well. You know, so what's going on? And, uh, and why is it important to learn? You know, you might, every one of your kids is different. They're all wired differently. Some of them just might not like school. I never liked school. I did enough to get by. I excelled in graduate school because I found my passion. But not every one of your kids is a great student. And that's okay. They can grow up and do something fine. But if they're not into it, they're not as passionate, then that's our job sometimes to make it more interesting. Make the work more relevant. You know, you are who you are. You're wired in a certain way. For some kids, school is going to be a lot harder than your other kids. And so for those kids, as opposed to having the same standard for each kid, say, you know what, every one of my kids is wired differently. For this daughter, school comes naturally and she's really self-motivated. This kid isn't. I shouldn't be mad at her, I should accept her and love her for who she is. And then come up with ways to help her with her education, as opposed to comparing her to her older sister. She should be hearing, you know, everybody's wired differently. School may not be your thing, but you'll do good enough, and then somewhere along the line, the passion's going to tick in, and you're going to find something and you're going to be great. You know, so let them understand that we're all wired differently. You don't have to compare kids and stuff like that. School does not come naturally to all kids. They just need to do good enough in some way. Now, why else is this so important to believe in every kid? We talked about when you really believe in every kid and have this incredibly positive inspirational attitude, you build great relationships, which fuels kids to do well. You attack the self-doubt that a lot of these kids have. You do it the ways we just talked about. Why else is it so important to be so powerfully inspirational in every kid? really believe in every kid, is that when you are like that, it leads to the four-letter H word, you can't live life without, which is hope. Hope is humanity's fuel. You could have a Mercedes bed out in the parking lot, it's going nowhere if it doesn't have fuel. Strength-based practice says every single kid you work with is a Mercedes bed, every kid in your house. But sometimes they're lacking fuel. You put the fuel in by saying the things, doing the things we talked about. Kids have to go to bed every night saying, you know, I'm kind of off track right now, things are tough. But boy, Dad gave me a really good talk today. said he went through the same thing. He talked about how he struggled with this stuff. But that I am going to turn it around. I'm going to do some amazing stuff. And he talked to me today about my future. Wow, you know, that made me feel so good. More and more evidence is coming out every day that says for kids to make it in life, they have to see the future, talk about the future. What happens to kids, they get stuck in the here and now. And it causes great stress. 
Stress is great relief when they can think a year, two years, five down, a month down the line, something that makes them feel good about themselves. If Lily says, okay, this will pass and I'm gonna do something great. James Garbarino, one of the world's foremost experts on kids, wrote that terminal thinking, the inability to articulate to one future may be a clue to why some kids make it, some don't. Rick Miller started a multi-million dollar training group in Arizona. He said he studied for seven years what makes kids successful. The first three things, first two things were all about kids need connections and relationships. Nothing new there, we've been talking about that. His third one got my attention. He said children succeed when they can talk about their future in four areas rather than one. Home and family, education and career, communities and service, hobbies and recreation. So what he says to parents like you is every now and then when you're driving with kids talking, Pick a, pick a question about the future and talk about it. Because the message to the kid is, wow, I am going to be someone successful. I am going to do that. I'm going to get through this adolescent or this kid stuff. And it kind of takes the pressure off them. It gives them hope for the future. And hope is fuel. You know? So ask kids now and then. You think you'll attend college when you're by or far away? What do, you, what do you want to be when you grow up? What kind of job? Do you think you'll travel out when you're older? Where might you? If you want a big family, a small family? So these are all like great questions that fall into one of those categories. So what, so you got a kid who's really struggling right now, and you start talking about those questions. What's the message you're sending to the kid? This is gonna pass, you're gonna make it. We all go through, we all get off track now and then. You know, wow, makes a kid feel good. Now I overdid it with my own daughter. You know, oh my God, I don't know how she made it. You know, I remember when she was five or six, we're driving to do our taxes one year. So I said to her like I did a lot. So Julie, what do you wanna be when you grow up? So she's in the back seat, she says, I've been thinking about it, Dad. Oh really, good. What are the top three? She says, number one, lawyer. I go, wow, Julie, I didn't even think you knew what a lawyer was. She says, Dad, I'm watching some TV. You know, I think I'd be a good lawyer. You know, I like to argue. Yeah. <laughs> I said, so yeah, I like that. I like that. What's number two? She says, I've been thinking about that too, Dad. You know I love school. I and my daughter loves school. I got so lucky because I hated school. Uh, she said, yeah, I'm thinking I could be a teacher. You know I love school. I said, Julie, I think you'd be a great teacher. What's number three? She says, motel pool cleaner. What? I pulled the car over. I, I said, wait, what did you just say? Motel pool cleaner. I said, why? Why would you want to be a motel pool cleaner? She looked at me like I was the most stupid man in America. She says, because they need cleaning. I go, okay, we'll find a motel pool cleaning college, you know, and you can do that, you know. But, you know uh, and, that, that, and that incident reminded me of an earlier incident. When she was three, we bought a new couch, really expensive. And we didn't scotch guard it yet. And so my daughter was sitting on the couch and she asked for a glass of milk. I'm like an idiot. I go and I bring it to her. And then she takes the cup of milk, pours it all over the couch. I go, what the hell? What? What? Why did you do that? I, you know? And she looks at me again like I'm the most stupid man in America. She says, because the cup was in my hand and it turned. <laughs> hey, Julie, you just answered every unanswered question in America. Why did you shoot the guy? Well, my finger was on the trigger and it went like this. You know, why'd you stab the guy? My hand went like this. What, are you stupid? You know, I'll never forget that stuff, you know. Uh, I came up with a technique years ago called positive predicting. So, you constantly talk to kids, how should we celebrate six weeks, you know, the best week? Hey, at the end of this year, how should we celebrate the best year in school you've ever had? You always put the cart before the horse. When I was trying to teach my daughter to bike ride, she had fallen a lot the year before. Right before I go to push her the second time, I said, Julie, she goes, what? And I took it because I knew she was so nervous. I said, which three people should we call in two minutes to give them the big news that you're now a bike rider? I mean, this is gonna be really momentous. Who should we call in two minutes to tell them that you can now ride the bike? She said, my friend Ali first, then Grandma Tybee, then Nana. I go, what? You can't call my mother second. You know Grandma Tybee, she's the big cheese. You call my mother first. No, I wanna call my friend Ali. She was riding that. Oh, come on. Please call my mother first. No, fine, see if I care. Two minutes later, she'd ride the bike. You always put the cart before the horse. I can tell you stories that make you cry about pots and predicting. How should we celebrate? Who should we call? I love this one for parents. I say, hey, Brandy. Is it Brandy? Hey, Brandy, can I ask you something? I've been talking to mom about this. 25 years from now, when you're a really successful person and you have a nice family and kids like that, um, what kind of kid are you going to be? Are you going to be the kind that comes over to the grandparents and lets us play with the kids a lot, and take an active role in their growing up? Or are you going to just give us like lip service? You know, because you're going to be so successful, have all this money and stuff, you're just going to like see us occasionally. Are you going to be the kind of kid that lets us be an active part of your parenting, like when you're really successful, or just like, a, you know, 
a little bit. Which, which kind of kid are you going to be? Are we going to be active pa grandparents, or just you're going to give us lip service when you're really successful and have the cars and the houses? What? I love that. I told mom that. Now you just said this to a kid who's really struggling in school. Well, see, he's going to bed thinking, well, she thinks I'm really going to be successful and all that stuff. And yet they're asking, they're really thinking, what kind of kid, you know, family? But it puts the car before the horse. I love this stuff. It's hysterical, you know. Uh, you know uh, what else? You know. So again, when you talk about the future in truly positive terms, you make any desired outcome more possible. When it's more possible, it becomes more probable. How are we going to celebrate? Who should we call? 20 years from now. And again, be honest with the kids. Sure, there'll be bumps along the road. It won't always be easy, but you'll do it. It's in you. It's in you. you know? uh, now, let me ask you a question. I know I can't raise my hand to this question. Maybe some of you can. Have any of you spent an entire day with your kids and not had a moment or two where you thought to yourself, what the hell do I say now? What the heck should I do now? Have you ever gone an entire day with your kids and not had a what the heck moment? What do I do now moment? Have you ever? I never have. I'm with my 20-year-old daughter, 10 seconds, and I'm thinking, what would a good parent say here? Go, oh, Charlie, write books, you should know this. How about the next time and every time thereafter for the rest of your career, you're in a difficult situation with your kids and you're not sure exactly what to say or do, and with adolescents, that, that happens all the time. How about for the rest of your life, every time you're in a difficult situation with a kid and you're not sure what to do, take a step back with the observing ego, the little voice that talks to you, say, it doesn't matter what I do. 20 years from now, this kid, this group of kids, I can remember what I said to them on October 27th, 2019 at 11.13 in the morning. But what do you hope you got every single kid in your house remembers about you 20 years from now? They come back to visit and reminisce. Not what you said any given day, but what? Hey Ma, remember I broke the window at school? Remember that? You know, and I got suspended a few days? I'll never forget as long as I live, Ma. I'll never forget as long as I live. The day my suspension was up, you woke me up with a big chocolate milk and two cream filled donuts from the local shop. He said, here you go, bro. I said, why are you giving me this? I broke the window. I was suspended. I'll never forget as long as I live, Ma. He looked me right in the eye and says, you made a really bad choice to break that window. You're a really good kid. It's time for you to get back into the schools. It's time to make a good choice because there's nothing you can't do in this world. You've gone off track, you know. Uh, and I got you the donuts for two big reasons. One, to remind you about that. You're gifted. But you've got to get back in the schools to make a good choices, you know. And two, I love you. I tell you, Ma, I don't think a day goes by I don't think about those donuts. Every time I drive by a donut shop, I think about you. And I had to come back and tell you today, I just got a promotion. I'm now the vice president of the company. I never could have done it without you, Ma. You know, um, I got you some donuts in the car. <laughs> <laughs> you know, bottom line, for the rest of your life, every time you're in a difficult situation with your kids, you should take a step back with the observing deal, the little voice that talks to you, say, it doesn't matter what I say or do. I'm going to do the best I can based on my skill level, my experience. But the most important thing I bring to this parenting is my attitude. There's a kid in this house that doesn't think I don't have that back, that doesn't believe in him. I can't wait to see him every day. And that in and of itself will change so many kids, you know. Um, based on everything I've told you so far, which is backed up by some of the most cutting edge research in neuroscience and psychology, it's become abundantly clear to me that to be a successful parent clearly means you have to be a great liar and a great actor. <laughs> Does anybody think this job of being a successful parent is about being honest with kids? Oh look, Tom Brady, California boy, lies through his teeth. What do I care as long as he gets me Super Bowls? Keep lying, Tom, get me number seven. Anybody think this job of being a parent is about being honest with your kids every day? Raise your hand. You're lying through your teeth all the time. Oh my man. You know, you got this teenager who's under your skin driving you nuts. 14 year old kid. She's got an eight hour visit with her best friend on Saturday. They're driving, they're going away for eight hours. You can't wait to get this kid out of your hair. You say goodbye, see you later, text me, I'm gonna miss ya, have a good time. Oh, thank God, she's gone. <laughs> 17 minutes later, she comes back into the house all pissed off. My visit was canceled, my mother's car had trouble, I'm gonna be here. What are you supposed to say? Are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> You're gonna be here all day, provoking me, giving me the adolescent crap? Well, why wait, start now, you jerk. I'm gonna be totally honest, totally honest, not in eight years. My man, I feel so bad. I know you're looking forward to that visit, you know, but I'm kind of psyched. Maybe we could do a few things later today. Uh, you know, I'm kind of psyched. I'll kill that freaking mother. I'll kill her. <laughs> I don't like the term lying. I like the term acting. When you're a great parent, you've got to be a great actor. You know, you can't be up 24-7, but I think a really great parent has to know there are times of the day, I don't care how you feel, and you turn it on. Bedtime, you know, uh, uh, waking up in the morning. You come back from work. I don't care how you're feeling. You got to look like there's nowhere else you'd rather be. 
You know, during the day, there are times you could be down or you could be rough. They need to see that, you know. But I think really, this business of parenting is, about, is all about probability. The better we do, the better they're going to do. And I like to think my daughter's doing better because I turned it on at those times. I wasn't always up all day long. I'm not saying that. I can still remember like yesterday. From the ages of like three to eight, I was working really hard hours. So you don't make it as a trainer right away. You've got to pay your dues. So I'm doing a few trainings here and there. Meanwhile, I'm doing awake overnights at group homes and things like that. I'm taking all these social work side jobs, really hard stuff. But I'd always rush home like around six o'clock, you know, to play a few hours with my daughter. And then I'd collapse on the back tape, on the black couch, you know, clicking and stuff like that. I was so tired. I often do an awake overnight and stuff like that. Every night for about five years, she would then, around 8.15, come through the back door with her, my wife behind her, and my wife would always say the same thing, Dad, it's Julie's bedtime. And I would always say, who's tucking you in tonight? Please pick me, please pick me. You picked mom yesterday. And I'm thinking, don't pick me, don't pick me. You know, I'm tired, really, don't pick me. And my daughter was such a ham. She likes stare at both of us like this. She'd go, five years she did this. I choose mommy. I go, oh, that's not fair, you choose mommy. And, I'm, and she's behind my wife. My wife's behind me, mm-hmm, you know. <laughs> But on those nights she'd pick me, I would jump out of that couch as fast as I can. I'd be so excited, and we'd start walking to the stairs to go upstairs, and I'd be, you know, after about 10 steps, we're in the kitchen, and I'm going, Fluffy, Fluffy the porcupine. I want, no, no, Olivia the pig. I want to read, no, 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 Moose on the Loose. I want to read that. And I, I can always remember, like yesterday, I'm about 10 steps to the, to the stairway, and I'm doing this Moose to Loose and talking about books, and all of a sudden I'm thinking, you're into it now. You are totally into it now. You can literally will yourself into this stuff. When you fake a positive thing, chemicals get released in your brain and you actually become positive. What would have been the message to my daughter if I had been honest with her? I said, I'm kind of tired tonight, Julie. I did the awake overnight. Can mom tuck you in? What's the message? He doesn't love me that much. You know? I'm not saying there are times you don't do that, but I think you want to have a high bar. Waking the kids up in the morning, saying good night to the kids. When you come back from work, Doing the bedtime story, I think there are certain times you turn it on. Does that sense to every kid? There's someone out there that really can't wait to see me, that thinks I'm one special kid. And I'll go to my deathbed thinking, that is the way we deal with kids. You know, it's so powerful. And as I mentioned to you before, almost everything I'm giving you today is backed up by some of the most cutting-edge research in neuroscience. All this positive stuff that I'm giving you, how you talk to kids, how you set limits, how you get excited, how you, are, you act. Um, uh, it's all backed up by the research. And here's some of that research. A guy named Sean Acker wrote an amazing book called The Happiness Advantage. He studies positivity for a living. That's research, reports on other research. I think his material is like the backbone for this whole strength-based approach. Here's some of his research that backs up everything I'm telling you, backs up the whole strength-based approach. Positive emotions flood our brains with dopamine and serotonin. Chemicals that only make us feel good, but dial up the learning centers of our brains to higher levels. Positive emotions help humans to organize new information, keep that information in the brain longer, and retrieve it faster later on. And they enable us to make and sustain more neural connections, which allows us to think more quickly and creatively, become more skilled at complex analysis and problem solving, and see and invent new ways of doing things. Brain change, once thought impossible, is now a well-known fact. One that is supported by some of the most rigorous and cutting edge research in neuroscience. You can't fight this stuff. When you're more positive, when you're doing all the stuff I talked about and more, literally chemicals get released in your kid's brain. They start using parts of it they never used before. Whereas if you're yelling, using punishment, not getting excited to see your kids, not doing the stuff, not talking about the future, brain stays down here. It doesn't be all that they can be. If they're struggling with, you know, I'm not good, I'm not, and you're not helping with their thinking, brain's not developing the way it should. Everything I'm giving you today is about getting your kids to use every part of that brain that they can. Now, when I became a strength-based guy, it took me a little while to figure out how some of this stuff applies specifically to parents. Two things came to mind. One is yes and no. Is there ever an age your kid is at where they're not asking you to do something a little out of their reach? The three-year-old wants to pull the bill. No. Six-year-old wants to cross the street by. No. Thirteen. Can I? No, no, no. Ask your father. You know? I'm not getting in front of a group of parents and saying you can't say no to kids. That'd be pretty ridiculous. But what's the message we send to kids when we say no a lot? What? You know, I don't think you could do it. And that dims that light, that spark of I could be somebody in this life. My wife and I have had tons of arguments over the last 20 years, many about yes and no. Could she possibly do this, this and that? I mean, I took my daughter, I dreamt of this. 
I took my daughter mountain climbing in the French Alps three years ago. We get to the top, and then my daughter wants to go hang gliding, 10,000 feet in the Alps. I said, no freaking way, I didn't take you to France to die. So what does she do, like she does every time? She gets mad at me, she calls mom, from France. And my wife agrees with her, so she goes hang gliding. You know, but it's a classic kind of thing. Did my daughter's life get better because of that? Yes. She did something that almost no kid done. She flew above the Alps, 10,000 feet. And the message was, we think you can handle this. You know, think about the message you send to a kid when they do. So the kid, the little kid pours the milk and spills it. Don't get mad. Say, let's try it. Let's practice this. So and then they do it. Oh, my God. Look at the kid pouring the milk. The big, let's call grandma and tell her that you poured the milk. You know, they'll remember that forever. So if the kid wants to do something out of their reach, don't be so quick to say no. Could they practice it? Could you try a few things out? And then when they do it, you get really excited. Because that, I think, is what builds this kid. Saying no says, I don't think he could do it. You know? So again, I'm not saying there's an easy answer here. I just want you to think about it every single time. Every single time your kid asks you to do something that's a little out of the reach, play it out. Could they practice it? Could they possibly do it? What's the repercussion if they didn't do it? And try to err on the side of giving them that message that I think you could do this. I think you could do this. Because boy, that builds independence. That builds a kid who says, I'm, I'm someone who can do something in this world. And the other thing I love to talk about, which is so big in our world, is encouraging kids to follow their own path. We have fantasies for our kids when they're born. You know, this kid's going to take over the family business. This kid's going to become a doctor. This kid's going to go to a four-year college. This kid's going to do the sport I always loved. And you know what? Sometimes the kid didn't get the message, you know, uh, that they don't like what that is. And every day in America, kids are being pushed down a path they don't want to go. You might have three kids. You're very athletic. Two of the kids love the sports that you're teaching them. One doesn't like it at all, and you get mad at the kid. And he's miserable because you're pushing him down. I had a friend at a school. She loved ballroom dancing. They forced the kids to do ballroom dancing. I watched them one time. I never saw the kid smile. I saw another father. He built a tennis court in his basement. Took his kid to tennis lessons almost every day. I never saw the kid smile. She was miserable. You know, you better understand every one of your kids is wired differently. And for them to be all that they can be, to be the happiest they can, you got to let them kind of go down the path they want. You can nudge them a little. You know, I, I think it should be mandatory for every parent, the second your first kid is born, to see the movie Billy Elliot. It should be mandatory. Billy Elliot's the movie about a minor in England. His wife had died. He has a 12-year-old son. He signs him off for boxing because that's what boys do. His fantasy was his son would be a jock and stuff. Kid goes to boxing lessons, hates it. Sees ballet being taught in the other room, wanders over there, and the instructor says, put your leg in the bar. And he does. Long story short, he ends up becoming a phenomenal dancer. When his father finds out that he's doing that, he forbids him, puts him down. He says, Dad, I'm not a wuss. I like girls. Boys do ballet. And I love it, Dad. I'm really good at it. No, no. Refuses to let him take ballet. But the kid still takes the ballet. And then near the end of the movie, the father catches him at a big dance hall. And instead of running away, the kid does this amazing dance around the perimeter of the book. And you can see the father starting to cry. He's looking at something amazing, how great his son is, and how he loves this dancing. Father turns around and runs two miles in a snowstorm to the instructor who was secretly teaching him and says, get him an audition to the Royal Ballet. And the next day, the father who's on strike becomes a scab to get money for the kid's belt. That's, 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 that's great parenting. Often being a great parent is grieving. You have fantasies for your kids. Oftentimes, for you to be the best parent you can be, and for them to be happy, you have to grieve the loss of the kid you wanted and say hello to the kid you have. In fact, there's a lady in uh, California, I think her name's Nancy Rose, wrote a book like that. It says, love the kid you got, not the kid you wanted. You, know? uh, you may give birth to a kid who has Down syndrome, Asperger's, a serious ADD. You may give birth to a kid who ends up becoming gay. Maybe that's not what you wanted, but that's who your kid is. And for you to accept that kid and help that kid be all that they can be, you have to often grieve the loss of what you wanted so you could say hello. And you literally go through stages of grief. First, you, you know, you think your kid's gay or something going on with them, or they don't like the sports you want, or they don't want to go to football, so you deny it. This will go away, they'll change. And then all of a sudden, you kind of get angry. This isn't changing. This is who they are. It's not what I value. It's not what I wanted for my kid. And then you get kind of sad, then you accept it. These are stages of grief. I walked into my local convenience store last year. A guy grabbed my arm. He says, thanks, Sean. Thanks. I said, what? He says, I don't know if you remember me. I'm the football coach in town. 
I went to your parent training two years ago. We gave birth to a girl seven years ago who has Down syndrome. I was having so much trouble with it until you went to your training. I realized I needed to grieve the loss of the kid I wanted so I could say hello to this beautiful girl. And it's still not 100% great, Charlie, but it's so much better since I went to your training. You have to say goodbye sometimes to what you, so you say hello to your kid. You know, you're all very educated people. Maybe you want your kid to go to a four-year school. What if your kid doesn't want to go to a four-year school? What if he wants to be a mechanic or be a musician or something like that? I'm not saying you can't push a little bit, but is that going to be really happy if you push him down the path he or she doesn't want to go or they're not wired for? You have to respect, be personality correct with your kids. Know what makes them tick. What's going to make them happy in life? And maybe it's not what you want. So the sports they do, the hobbies they do, the academics, really get to know your kids. And you know them. Of course you know them. You know how they're wired. You know from the day they're born how they have a different kind of wiring. You know, that's the other thing, too. You might be a loud and type A person like me, and you give birth to a kid who's kind of shy. What's the temptation? You push the kid to be, and, and it drives the kid crazy. You know, I get along great with my daughter, although we fight sometimes, because we have the same personality, we know it. And my wife's thinking we're getting into a big thing, and I said, no, that's, not, that's just not, that's the way she is. But it drives my wife crazy, because she's more shy and reserved. You know, and sometimes they have trouble because of that. If I had given birth, if we given birth to a kid who was kind of shy and laid back, oh, I probably would have made her life miserable. She'd be in therapy. So I'd be pushing her into social situations and stuff like that. So you gotta love your kids for who they are, who their core self is. You know, and this is really important. So be careful about what you're pushing them towards. You can't, it's okay to nudge a little, but really know your kid and what makes them tick. And that means that we have so many adults in this world who are miserable because their parents pushed them down the path they didn't want to go, that they had some fantasy for. Sometimes you gotta say goodbye to that fantasy, you know. Uh, let me see what time is that. I'm gonna move past that one. Uh, quickies, I love the train metaphor. I use this all the time with kids. I tell kids, every kid is like a train, big powerful train. If your kid's acting out like a lot of teenagers do, you're off track. You got some wheel spinning, oil sipping, smoke spelling, we just gotta get you back on track. We're not doing anything this weekend. You're not going anywhere this weekend until we get this train back on track. That's so much nicer than you being rude, you being mean, you being this stuff. When my daughter was four years old, she come up to me, I know dad, yep, train's on track, train's on track. No playground, you know? And I used it when she was 19, I use it even now. It's so much nicer than you being rude, you being mean. Hey guys, this family is off track. We got wheels spinning, oil sipping. We're not doing anything this weekend until we get this train back, until we sit down being so much nicer. All trains get off track, all trains get off track. This is really critical. From the moment your kids wake up in the morning to the moment they go to bed, they should have multiple opportunities for success. That means you're creating things, modifying, tapping things. All the literature on kids says the same thing. If you want your kids to be happy, they really should have something that they're good at. Every time I get referred to an acting out kid, we find them a hobby, a sport, something with music, something. All the literature is really clear. When kids are good at one thing that they like, that they look forward to, it affects everything else in their life. And so every kid you have is different. Maybe this kid should be in music lessons. This kid should be sports. This kid is art. This kid is this. But if you could really nurture, encourage your kids to follow their passion, they have such a better chance of being successful. Success in one area. It's the greatest therapy in the world. You know, in fact, in the strength-based world, we have a saying. We focus on doing versus understanding. What's the message you send to kid if you say you need to be in therapy three days a week? I'm one hurt kid. I'd rather see a therapist once a week, but then take a music lesson, uh, be in a sport, take Taekwondo, stuff like that. You know, find that one thing. And if you have to cajole the kid a little bit, I have no problem with bribing the kid a little bit. Some kids are really cautious about trying something because they're afraid I'm going to look stupid, I won't do it. Sometimes I'll bribe a kid to try it a few times because they know if they do it two times, they'll want to do it forever. It's sometimes it's that barrier, they're cautious. I hate the term assistant, they're cautious about trying stuff. But success in one area will generalize to all of areas. Very critical, very critical. Uh, I'm gonna move, as we gotta finish up here, we finish up with one of my favorite things to talk about, one line wrapping. I have this technique I've been using for about 23, 24 years, where you give a kid a line, or a parent, you know, or a teacher, and you have them say it over and over again with rhythm, repetition, rhyming, and humor, gets into long-term memory, and they use it for behavior gain, it's so amazing. It works with all age kids. I did a training at a psychiatric facility for adolescents many years ago. Did the training on a Monday. On Thursday, I got an email from the director. says, Charlie, thanks for coming. It's already working. We have a 16-year-old girl here who hadn't taken a shower in three months. 
We tried everything, rewards, consequences, change of medication, nothing worked. We're pulling our hair out. Three of my staff that you're training on Monday stood in front of a room this morning and chanted, Don't be sour! Take a shower! Take a shower. Don't be sour! Don't be sour. Kid laughed, jumped into the shower. I go back to your lady, did that really happen? I've been telling everybody around America, don't be sour and take a shower. So not only did it happen, I forgot to tell you, she came up with it the night before. Then they go like this, they go, what? So I forgot to tell you, she also came up with, don't be a dope, use the soap. Why does this work? It's totally neurological. You know why this works? Drive home. Put on a CD, you haven't heard in two years, but you played religiously for five years. Oh, Crosby, Stills, Nash & Young, Santana, Beatles, you know, California hillbilly music, I don't know, whatever you like. After the first song ends, what are you doing? You're humming the next one. You couldn't possibly tell me what it is. Yeah, it's right there. I say to kids, are you thinking about this line when you walk into the situation? Kids go, no, it's already in the mystery. You know? I was working with a middle school student a few years ago. He came from a very rich family, but he had profound learning disabilities. And so he had to go to the resource room every day at school, and he hated that. So he's crucifying the two resource room teachers. So they called me to work with the kid. I said, what's the name of the resource room teacher? They said, Mrs. Mulford and Mrs. Mucci. And Mrs. Mucci hates him so much that she's thinking of quitting, you know? So I said, okay, okay. Now he's a very rich kid, came from a very classy family, I visited the house. So I met with him the next day, and we played cards a little while. Then I said to him, all right, Ben, repeat after me. Mulford and Mucci, say it. Mulford and Mucci. Treat like Mucci. <laughs> I'll do the first half, you do the second half. Mulford and Mucci. Treat like Mucci. Mulford and Mucci. Treat like Mulford and Mooch. Treat like Gooch. Mulford and Mucci. Malfit and Moochie, Malfit and Moochia, treat like Moochia. You know, over and over we did it. A week later, I got an email from the principal. What the hell did you do with this kid? He's been a saint all week. Malfit and Moochie cannot believe how nice he is. He goes six weeks without any disrespect. It's, people are flabbergasted. I am, this is like 20 years ago. After six weeks, I said to him one day, can I ask you something? He goes, sure. So when you walk into that resource room, are you thinking Malfit and Moochie treat like Gucci? He says no. Then he did what 30 other kids have done over the last years. Crane said his stuff is already in the mystery. It's neurological. One of the great researchers of all time, uh, Bruce Perry on trauma, he said the brain is designed to change in response to pattern repetitive stimulation. If you hear these lines over and over again, they get into your head and they start using them. Every night of my life when I go to bed, I see a light in my head, a sign. Make a list that will assist. I haven't gone to bed in 20 years without making a list. Rhythmic self-talk, it's amazing. You know, why does it work? It's all neurological. You know why this works? Seven times seven is what? Why do you know that? It's not interesting. Why do you know that? If someone drilled it in your head, you can't get it out. You know, you're gonna be in your deathbed. You'll be 93, you'll be in some flea bag hospice, gasping for breath. You'll hear a little grandkid out in the waiting room doing a homework, seven times seven. Fine, fine, and then you'll die. You know that's true, you can't get 49 out of your head. There's no such thing as a subanectomy. So my kind of thing is, if you can't get seven times seven out of your head, you know you can't. Why are we giving kids with ADD step after step? That's the prep. Little by little, play the fiddle. No need to grow when I can start on my own. Don't move all over the place. Sit and learn with a happy face. Make a list, it will assist. Anger, let it go, Joe. Let it go, Joe. Just stay cool, no need to blow. I can't, I will, I gotta chill, and if I do, it's quite a thrill. If you get mad, don't do bad. Just talk or walk, talk or walk, or NBD. Easier than one, two, three. No big deal, no big deal. Girlfriend doesn't call you back, brother. What are you thinking? NBD. Easier than one, two, three. No big deal. In my packet, which you can get, or on my website, charlie.com, I have tons of these. I could tell you stories that would make you cry, how one line changed a kid's life. Now a teenager, it's hard to give them to them, you know, but they create their own stuff. And you kind of talk to them about how it's like advertising, it's all brain stuff. Use the seven, you might get a kid to use this stuff, and man, we've changed lives, like the kid from the movie. Um, you say, we're running out of time, right? Where's Mary Charlene? Um, do I have a few minutes or what? Yeah, sure, a couple minutes and then we'll get Okay, I'll tell you one quick story, and then I'll give you a little music to finish. Uh, I did a training in Boston many years ago. Mother emailed me two months later. She says, Charlie, I was at your training. I was so depressed. I have a 16-year-old daughter who's been hospitalized, oppositional defiant. We've been fighting for years. I was so depressed that day. Um, I felt like I was missing all her adolescence. A few months after your training, I'm on the phone with her at the hospital. We're fighting like we always fight. In the middle of the phone call, I, 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 I said, what the hell? Why not try something new? So I yelled at her. I said, Julia. She goes, what? I said, repeat after me. She goes, what? Just repeat after me. 
Say it when you see it. Stop and think. Don't be a dick. Stop and think. 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 Said at the end of the phone call, we were laughing so hard. The final words from the kid to the mother was, Mom, I haven't felt this good in three years. How do we start today's trip? We get kids feeling good, opens up the brain. Mother sent to my CD, One Line Raps of Girls and Chaps, you know, where I put the stuff to music. And uh, she said she played it nonstop, had a dramatic turnaround. They moved up her discharge date. And then right before the discharge date, she starts freaking out over the discharge plans. So they came up with Stop and Listen, because you don't know what you're missing. Stop and Listen. She said it was the first time in her life she could connect her thoughts to her actions. It's amazing. If you have a brain, it could be rewired. Why are we just using this for seven times seven? I don't know. So uh, as we finish today, a uh, couple of little quickies here. I, oh, it's my I uh, noticed years ago that when I was using the self-talk with kids, it became more powerful when you put it to music. You know how you can't get a song out of your head? So I have a, a one for younger kids. I'm not going to play it right now. It has all the self-talk. It's out there. But the reason I want to bring this up now is, and then about... So I focused on my music and self-talk with kids. And then about 10 years ago, I did a training for foster parents. And a mother comes up to me at the break, says, remember me from last year's conference? I go, yeah, you had a big issue. What was it? She said, I was the big yeller. Now, that really interests me. I've been trying to get parents to stop yelling at the kids. I said, what'd you do about that? I'm really curious. She said, oh my God, Sean, it was amazing. I went home after your training. I sat down with my three kids. And we came up with, don't yell, gently tell. Don't yell. Don't yell. Don't yell. Couldn't get out of my head. I'm singing it all night. By the time I woke up, it had become a Gregorian chant. <laughs> Don't yell. <laughs> Everybody. Don't yell. <laughs> I got so excited. I maxed out my credit cards, refinanced my house, hired 40 of the greatest singers in New England to do our next CD, Parent Rhapsody. Songs and musical mantras is also parenting. And the first thing I did was went to Temple Shalom in Newton Mass, where I was by Mitzvah, where they had a great choir, they were amazing, weren't even Jewish. They went to the dressing room and hired them to sing Don't Yell, Gently Tell, and three other songs. If you yell at your kids um, and you want to stop, all you have to do is hear this, maybe once or twice, and you'll never yell again. But you will curse me the rest of your life. <laughs> because it, it, it's an incredibly addictive song. You don't, you don't have to buy the CD. If you go on YouTube and put in Don't Yell, Gently Tell, you'll see four months in a bed singing to a mother who's yelling at her kid. Don't yell, gently tell. Uh, a lady in Canada emailed me last couple months ago. She said, Charlie, you won't believe it. My three-year-old daughter wakes up every morning and says, Play it, Mom. And it's Don't Yell, Gently Tell. She gets in the car. Play it, Mom. Little kids love this stuff because they want their parents to do the right thing. So if you yell, you hear this two or three times, you never yell again, but you'll curse me the rest of your life because you can't get it out of your head. But you might not be yelling anymore. Here we go. Now I bring in the 30 trumpets. Hey, Dad, 
your kids aren't parental, you've got to know them, developmental. And if you understand the stage, then you might not feel the rage. Understand each age helps reduce your rage. I've been walking around for years. It should not be this much fun. He leaned over and said, Charlie, I stopped yelling, but I hate the song. But it's all about, remember, it's all about rhythmic self-talk. It's all about getting in the brain waves. You can't get this stuff out of your head. So, you know, with teenage, younger kids, if you sell it to them, it'll work. <laughs> it's amazing. All right, I think I got to have most of the stuff I want to talk to you. Uh, remember, as I finish today, if you love your kids, that's 90% of parenting. You can yell at them, punish them, do anything, they'll grow up fine. The stuff I gave you today is the extra 10%. You know? So uh, have fun, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.